בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back here on a Wednesday night uh, to uh, stop the rabbi, שיעור series, ברוך השם, we are up to 106, 106 lectures, uh, countless questions, ברוך השם, if you simply uh, do, let's say, an average of 10 questions per שיעור, which it's usually closer to 20, maybe even 30 sometimes, you have yourself a couple of thousand uh, questions, ברוך השם. Um, so tonight's show will be uh, for Refuah uh, Shlema and Aslacha Rabba for a lot of uh, wonderful people. Uh, but uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, wish a uh, happy birthday and a, a very big Aslacha Rabba to uh, my very dear friend, Mamash Yedid Libi Avram Ben Surya, Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Oto Vet Mishpachto. וכל מכל כל חיים ארוכים, שלמים, מלאים תורה, מצוות וגמילות חסדים. התנאי ציור הוא בפרי הרפואה שלמה של רבנית לבנה בת שרה, רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, דוד בן עשריה, דוריס בת ז'ורה, יתרו בן אברהם, אורית בת אילנה, אולגה בת לובה לאה, מזל בת תמרה, Emma Bat Dvora. And um, also for a Refua uh, Shlema for Hinda, Chaya Bat Chana, and Chaim Akiva Ben Hinda Esther, Refua Ta Nefesh, Refua Ta Guf. And also for a Atzlacha Rabba for Amir Ben Shahin, Itro Ben Avraham. Shaul Ben Farzane, um, Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, Alex Ben Noach, Joshua Ben Noach, David Ben Esriya, Doris, uh, Doris Bajora, um, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, Ruben Chaim Ben Pala Parel, Itro Ben Avraham, Marsha Bat Judy, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sephos Ben Marsha, Uh, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, and uh, also for a uh, Zivug for Liora Bat Mazal, Moshe Ben Mazal, Sara Bat Esther, Moshe Ben Daphna, and Yehudit Bat Daphna. הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אותם בכל מקרה הכל, חיים ארוכים, שלמים, מלאים תורה, מצוות, גמילות חסדים. To them and to all the wonderful people that continue to support everything that we do, all the giveaways, all the uh, distributions, the books, the lectures, Shtabach Shimo, lots and lots of wonderful things. So Rabotai Yekarim, we are uh, here, we're closing a year. Uh, this will be the last year of the year. Uh, we're going to take some time uh, over the next few days to uh, reflect, try to do tshuva b'ezot Hashem, uh, try to uh, prepare for the very big day. Uh, but don't worry, I didn't leave you hanging. Uh, perhaps the strongest uh, lecture of the year has been the Tikkun Abrit, which we really uh, uh, started off uh, the year strong. We had the middle of the year, we had the Tikkun Abrit movie which has reached millions of people at this point. I believe we're uh, approaching close to 10 million people have watched this movie in one way or another, whether it's on the app or on the uh, YouTube channels in different languages, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in uh, French, German, Russian, English, Hebrew, all types of languages. We have it in nine different languages. Um, or they watched it on our Tikkun Abrit channel tikkunabrit.org. Uh, so there are many ways to watch this movie and they some even watched it in different people's uh, different channels, different uh, uh, friends and students that have their channels and uh, uh, got the permission to put the, uh, the, the movie there. Some people didn't get the permission but we let it go. But the key is to get people to um, do tshuva and to realize first and foremost there's something wrong. Now, it's a very big day coming. 
Judgment Day is no joke. Judgment Day is not a day to just say what's up to all the people you didn't see all year. And B'Siyat uh, Bishmaya, our team Hashem, has completed another major production. Uh, it's a uh, extraordinary movie. I uh, personally hate it. Yes, yes, you heard me right. I hate it. Not because it's not good. I hate it because it's so good that it scared the living lights out of me. And when you have to uh, help produce a film that keeps scaring the living lights out of you, meaning you have to keep watching it and go over this and go over that, because it reminds you of the much scarier reality, meaning that as scary as the movie is, reality is much, much scarier. And it causes you to cry because you realize that. I hate it, but I hate it because I know we need to do tshuva Hashem Yishmo. So obviously, Yeti Bishmaya, with all of the Yetzirah that we've had, attack us in every way, shape, or form over these last few months especially. Even this last week, YouTube shut down our channel, Ishtabach Shimo, but don't worry, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do tshuva before it's too late. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do tshuva seriously when we show up to the big day. In just a few days, we have Rosh Hashanah. He wants us to do tshuva before we get there. So, Baruch Hashem, He allowed us to um, complete this film, complete all the edits, complete all the copyright issues that we had to overcome and so on. And uh, Baruch Hashem, we, uh, we have it ready. And as Baruch Hashem, it's going to be released Motzei Shabbat. This Motzei Shabbat, it's going to be released on all of our channels. I uh, highly recommend that you watch it because if you haven't done tshuva yet, this will get you to do tshuva. And if this doesn't get you to do tshuva, do tshuva um, it's most, li most likely you're a lost cause. Um, I say most likely because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has uh, performed an uh, endless amount of miracles. Maybe he could perform a specialized miracle for you to get you to do tshuva if you don't get do tshuva from something like this. But needless to say, this is a fantastic movie. And uh, Bezat Hashem will be releasing it Motzei Shabbat. So we'll give everybody enough time to not only watch it once or more, uh, but also time to uh, wake up from the shock that they get from this movie. Uh, to reflect and Bezat Hashem to prepare. To prepare for the big day, not just by making more cookies and cakes, not just by you know, uh, discussing all the different meals and where you're going to eat and you're going to eat at his house or her house and that house, but also reflect by doing tshuva. So that will be the, uh, the way we finish off the year. Uh, in the meantime, there's, of course, a lot to do. A lot to do. Uh, the uh, campaign that we have in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem, has surpassed any metric that we could possibly have. Uh, we've surpassed Last year, by over tenfold, uh, the amount of money, the amount of people. Uh, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. I just got another video today of uh, some of the wonderful people that uh, uh, said thank you and you know took a uh, short uh, film. And now we're working on uh, uh, putting uh, English translation on it, subtitles on it. I know it doesn't really make much sense for us to release anything without uh, English uh, subtitles on it simply because most of our audience are English speakers. Uh, but needless to say, that will change over time. We'll gain more and more people from uh, Eretz Israel, just like Rabbi Ephraim has and Rav Chaim has and some of our own, uh, some of our own uh, rabbis that only speak Hebrew. So we have that. That's going to come out, Bezal Hashem, I'm hoping by tomorrow. This little short uh, film, just uh, a feel-good uh, for all of the donors that donated and they see that the money is going somewhere. For all of you uh, late bloomers that have not donated for the uh, Rosh Hashanah campaign, uh, I uh, highly recommend that you do. Uh, again, this is not one of those times where a person should think that they could fulfill their obligation by just giving whatever pocket change they have. This is a time where a person should do as much as they possibly can. Uh, if you could afford 10,000, you should do 10,000. If you could afford 100,000, do 100,000. If you could afford 10 million, do 10 million. If you could afford $10, do $10. It's, 
it, the amount of money is not necessarily as, as, a, uh, as important as the effort. And that's really one of the things I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, because, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, a little while uh, you know, under our belt, Baruch Hashem, of teaching people. Uh, teaching people all types of things. Uh, we have all uh, types of series. We've had the Musar Pirkei Avot, almost uh, 200 lectures with an uh, average lecture about three hours. Uh, we have uh, over 100 movies we've made from these different lectures. We have the Geret Ramban, we have the Stump the Rabbi, amazing questions about God, and Emunah Bitachon. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the series we have right now, the Gaomi Vilna, the uh, Chazonish. Baruch Hashem, we've made quite a few lectures, thousands of lectures, thousands of uh, short clips, thousands of ways to get close to Am Yisrael, get Am Yisrael close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, get the world close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And at times I would talk about different things, sometimes it will be Alacha, sometimes Musal, Sometimes a shkafa, sometimes a combination thereof, answering questions, uh, questions about the different midrashim, different confusions, ideology, different things that are happening in the world, try to get people to stop being crazy, expose the wicked people that are really crazy, but nonetheless, no one sees it until we bring it out. So we've done, Baruch Hashem, we've done. But there's one thing that I've tried to teach, I've tried, um, and I've had uh, even a couple of lectures about it, I think, uh, if my memory serves me right. But um, the reality is, is that you really can't teach this. There's one thing that I can't teach you, and it doesn't matter how many of my lectures you've watched, and it doesn't matter how loyal of a student you are, or a friend, or a follower, or even an enemy. It doesn't matter. I can't teach you. There's one thing I can't teach you, and don't worry. It's not Kabbalah or the other things. The time will come for everything. There's one thing I can't teach you. One thing that it's really impossible to teach. And... That's Mesirut Nefesh. Self-sacrifice. You can tell people about it. You can tell them stories about it. Personal stories. Stories of tzaddikim that have done it. Different examples. Theorize to different uh, situations and circumstances. But the truth be told is that you cannot teach Mesirut Nefesh. You can't convince somebody to sacrifice themselves, sacrifice their time, sacrifice their livelihood. You can't teach somebody to do such a thing. You can't teach or convince somebody to do it because self-sacrifice is not a one-time thing, usually. Self-sacrifice is a lifestyle. Self-sacrifice is an ideology that is an addition to your current ideology. It's like the extra credit, the little extra superpower that some people possess and everyone would love to have. Self-sacrifice is one of those things where you either have it or you don't. You either are willing to sacrifice thank you Vimesh or you're not willing to sacrifice there's no way that you can teach somebody about self-sacrifice and thereby that person says okay now that I know what it is I'm gonna do it that person may hear your stories may like the things you say and the examples but when push comes to shove it's either in them or it's not. And even if they're able to do it one time, still doesn't mean that they're living a life of Mesirut Nefesh. 
because making a one-time sacrifice could simply mean you went crazy for a moment or you simply weren't thinking or a lot of other different things. Self-sacrifice is not a one-time thing. Self-sacrifice, which in Hebrew in Tzfat HaKodesh is called Mesirut Nefesh, is something you program into your neshama that this is the only way to be. This is why the Rambam writes that when somebody makes a donation, it's not necessarily a good indication of whether they're generous or not if they made a single large donation. If they made a, you know, if they make regular donations, then that shows their generosity. But if they made a one-time donation, that's a very large donation, it's not necessarily an indication that they're generous. Could simply be they went crazy that one day. Could simply be they had, you know, excitement of the moment, but the next day they go back to being a Scrooge. The next day they can go back to being a stingy little sting and they won't even want to share a uh, bottle of water with you. The one that's generous typically does it regularly. But again, just because somebody gen- donates regularly doesn't mean that they're generous. Why? Because it also has to be relative. If a person that has you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in a bank donates, I don't know, a dollar a day, He's not generous. He's actually a very arrogant, stingy person. Stingy for obvious reasons. Donating uh, $365, uh, you know, it's not exactly a uh, 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 relative to the amount of money that he has. So obviously he's very stingy. But arrogant because... He's really only doing it not because he actually believes that this one dollar is helping anybody, but rather he wants to give himself the good feeling of someone that's generous and rather he wants to get the attention of someone that gives by giving every day. Every day, the person that he gives to says thank you or the company sends him an automatic email that says thank you and he likes it, it gives him a good feeling. But this is... Unfortunately, not a uh, very good, uh, very good indication of his generosity. But the Rambam does combine the two things, where he says that if you want to overcome stinginess, where you probably you have you, know, you just have one of those diseases, spiritual diseases, where you're very stingy, then get yourself acclimated to giving by giving a little bit every day. Decide a certain amount that you can give that you could. Uh, 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 let yourself part with and divide it up into small portions and give it up over a period of time. If let's say it's a hundred dollars, then divide it up into I don't know, let's say a hundred different uh, homeless people or uh, or fifty different homeless people and so on. You know, sometimes I see people donate to our organization where they'll donate one dollar, uh, uh, you know, in uh, in Staka, or sometimes maybe they'll, they'll push themselves and get a dollar fifty. And again, if this is truly what you have, then there's obviously no uh, no harm in doing so. It's a very good idea, but many times it's not. Many times people donate that one dollar just because they want to take out, they feel like it's a Staka box. Now, for my recommendation, if you only if, if you only have one dollar, that's all you have to your name, keep it to yourself. as other Hashem. Hashem will give you more blessing. Don't keep, don't make yourself homeless. Don't make yourself so poor. If you do have a lot more than, and you simply can't allow yourself to give more than a dollar, then give the dollar to the local synagogue. Give the dollar to the local homeless person. Don't donate, on, donate it online. And the reason why is because there are minimum charges that each uh, merchant bank that processes the credit cards charges. And by the time that dollar goes through all of the different banks, you know, almost half of it is gone. That this is only, not because they take 50% of every transaction. Uh, quite, quite the opposite. Usually the uh, banks take somewhere around 3%, maybe 4%. Uh, but that's it. They don't take uh, 50%. But they also have a minimum. And that minimum usually is somewhere around 40 or $0.50. Cents, which means that if you're donating $1, that $1 is not what uh, is actually getting to that, uh, that beneficiary, let's just say. But the point being is, is that if someone is going to try to get themselves to sacrifice, to change their ways, 
to 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 help others change their ways they have to know that sacrifice is required for all of us it's not necessarily a suggestion but it's just one of those things where you can't teach somebody they have to simply be willing to do it you can tell them theories you can tell them stories but this is not one of those things where i teach you the halacha and therefore you'll know exactly how to light the menorah or build the sukkah self-sacrifice is not like that and this week's parasha parasha nitzavim akadosh baruch Hu talks to us again through moshe rabenu and says to us atem nitzavim ayom kulchem lifne adonai loechem rashechem shiftechem ziknechem shotrechem kol ish yisrael you are standing today all of you before hashem your god the heads of your tribes your elders your officers all the men of israel your small children your women your converts who's in your midst of the, your camp from the hewer of your wood to the drawer of your water in so many words who says i'm talking to all of you not just this one not just that one but all of you now in case people think like the heretics of the world where they say yeah this is only hashem commanding am israel to follow the commandments and it, it's israel it's just that generation you know it's not really relevant to us Kadosh Baruch Hu makes sure that we understand clearly without even using commentary that this is not just for the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu but rather all of us today not with you alone do I seal this covenant and this imprecation but with whoever is here standing with us today before Hashem our God and with whoever is not here with us today so here we see that everything that is said in this torah this entire covenant is for all of us and then moshe rabbeinu starts prophesizing telling us all types of things that all generations will have to deal with And interestingly enough, he tells us about the different pitfalls that we all have to deal with, which all have a single solution, a requirement that most people either never learned, or even if they did, simply are not willing to do it. And that's Mesirut Nefesh. Moshe Rabbeinu prophesizes and tells us of what's going to happen to us in the future. Different obstacles we're going to have to deal with. What kind of obstacles? He says to us, for you know how we dwelled in the land of Egypt and how we passed through the midst of the nations through whom you passed and you saw their abominations and their detestable idols of wood and stone of silver and gold that were with them he's telling us what we saw so we know what is going to be in the future because there's no purpose of telling us about things that happened in the past if this is not something we're ever going to have to deal with again there are different things that happened in the past but are not mentioned in the literal Torah because we don't necessarily have to deal with them in fact, the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that Am Yisrael had over 1.2 million prophets throughout the generations, yet only 55 are mentioned in the Tanakh. 48 men and 7 women. Why are only 55 out of 1.2 million mentioned? Because while all prophets that prophesied said things that were important said things that were the word of god said things that could have meant 
life or death only the 55 that had each word that they said calculated in heaven to the extent where HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that that word that prophecy will matter to every single generation from that moment on meaning that everything that is written in the Tanakh says the Gemara in Masechet Megillah everything that's mentioned in the Tanakh is by those one of those 55 prophets and therefore everything that is mentioned in the Tanakh total of 24 books five books of Moses and then 19 other books everything in that Tanakh is relevant to every single generation needless to say the generation before Mashiach where we are every verse every paragraph every prophet is somehow connected to us today and here of course the highest level of prophecy was Moshe Rabbeinu's and he's telling us that remember the past we saw these idolaters that Hashem allowed them to capture us to have us as as their slaves despite their abominations what were their abominations wood stone silver gold but yet it's not necessarily just a problem that they were an abomination but rather the fact that despite their abomination Hashem allowed them to have us as slaves why would Hashem allow the idol worshipers to enslave to torture to kill his firstborn child Amisrael why because despite the fact that they were idolaters you fell for the trap and became idolaters too and therefore you need to know dear children that it's not just the past that we have to worry about and not just the future but in the present today about to start off the year 5782 secular calendar Gregorian calendar 2021 is almost complete right now you have the very same problems that we had 3333 years ago before HaKadosh Baruch Hu released us from slavery the slavery of the idol worshipers what was the slavery wood stone silver and gold how is it related today wood could easily be an indication of the Christian cross stone is one of the statues that people like to have in their in their houses of Buddha or some other type of forbidden form of a statue or could it be Islam second biggest religion in the world silver also means kesef means money the idolatry of money gold is also not just money but also honor people looking for honor people looking for attention they want to build a building to build themselves a name says the Rabbi Chaimi Volozin the generation before Mashiach will have a different and unique Erev Rav some of which will be religious Jews or at least they seem religious that build institutions just for the sake of their own name that's all they built the Steve Smith synagogue obviously I don't believe there's such a synagogue but all types of names they'll put I even saw one time a building campaign for yeshiva where they actually have the 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 uh the uh, message you know the motto of this campaign to raise several million dollars for this building what was the motto of the game build yourself a name just like the tower of babel unbelievable but here they're trying they're saying that they're going to build themselves a name by building a house of Torah maybe they should learn Torah first but 
So a lot of people will chase false religions. A lot of people will chase false ideologies, kavod, all types of things. This is all different types of avodah zarah. Avodah zarah literally means serving something else, something foreign, something that's not God. Now most people don't think that this is a problem. Even though our sages tell us, call Israel Aravim Zelaze, all of Am Israel are connected to each other. People say, yeah, connected, but I'm religious. What connection do I have to this non religious guy? Yeah, you know, we're connected, but she's my sister and I'm her brother, and yeah, we both have the same mother and father, but she grew up, she's already married and went on with our life, and I'm married and went on with my life. Why do I have to? Call her just to see where her spiritual status is. Why do I have to send her a lecture just to make sure that she realizes she has to do tshuva because I heard that her kids are all going to, you know, public schools or they're going to religious public schools. You guys ever hear of the religious public schools? There are religious public schools now. What's a religious public school? Modern Orthodox. That's a religious public school where the kids go there and they learn i don't know chumash navi a few different things but they're also able to play boys and girls together they're also able to do all types of things and the overwhelming majority of them graduate complete mechalel shabbats i know this from eyes i saw testimony of students i have one guy tells me he's the last Shomer Shabbat in his graduating class. Entire graduating class. One guy left. Keep Shabbat. He went to a religious public school. Modern Orthodox school. People ask me, is it better to go to public school or to, or, or to uh, this uh, religious public school? The, the modern Orthodox. It's a very, very difficult question to be honest with you. It's not a very simple question. It's not as simple as it sounds. Why? Because if you go to public school, but you get religious tutoring, I send you one of my students, I send you Rabbi Asher, I send you Rabbi Leib, I send you one of the tzaddikim that's going to teach you. More time than not, you're going to stay strong and you're going to realize that, yes, I'm going to public school, but I have every day, I learn Torah, I do mitzvot, I uh, keep Shabbat. It's just that my parents are upside down and they don't realize I have to go to a yeshiva or I can't convince them or some other type of reason that you can't go to a yeshiva yet. But nonetheless, you're still getting a Torah education and you're still realizing every single day you are Jewish. Everybody else over there is not. And you're constantly reminded that you are Jewish and everybody else is not. On the other hand, when you go to the religious public school, i.e. the modern Orthodox school, much more difficult. Why? You go over there, almost everybody's Jewish. Almost everybody's Jewish, but they're all acting like Goyim most of the time. Why do I say almost everybody's Jewish? I'm sure somebody noticed that. Because that's the truth. Almost everybody's Jewish. Not everybody's Jewish. There's a school over here, maybe about an hour and a half from my house, where when I spoke to the principal, after speaking to one of their students, and speaking to the mother of the student, and not believing what they said, because it simply was, I don't know, just I, I couldn't believe the world was getting that dumb, I called the principal. I said, let me ask you a question. Is it true that you have non-Jewish kids attending your Jewish school? And she said, yeah, of course. Why not? And I I I had to catch myself. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? Why why not? The Jewish school. Because yeah, but they pay the tuition. So I realized I'm talking to an idiot here. And I said to her, okay, fine. Um, how much would you say, like, what percentage of your school, your Jewish school, are not Jewish? She said, oh, probably 50%. 50% of the Jewish school is not Jewish. Shtabach <laughs> You have? You have? You have? Wait, you think it's uh, only here? In England. Where are uh, Mervis? Melvis and his uh, homosexual promotion uh, 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 books and his Chavruta, uh, Dvik. What do they have over there? They have Jewish schools with 85% of the students are not Jewish. 85% are not Jewish. So we have a whole shiur about 
how Jewish schools need to discriminate if they want to remain Jewish. So you have many people not realizing such a thing, not realizing so, not realizing that there is a need to discriminate. We're not saying hate. We're not saying beat up anybody. We're saying Jewish schools should be Jewish with Jewish teachers and Jewish students. Not Jewish school. Not Jewish. Simple. Very simple. If you're a Jew and you go try to join some uh, Ahmadijad school, you're not going to have such an easy time joining. Why are they going to think you're probably, I don't know, maybe part of the the Israeli uh, uh, secret uh, forces or something? Yeah, but he's only eight. Yeah, you never know with these Israelis. But the truth is that uh, this problem is everywhere. And you have now missionaries already implanted inside religious Jewish community. So much so that people have no concept that they are not Jewish. So much so that they've implanted their tentacles into the community for long enough to learn the hebrew language long enough to get someone to give them a rabbinical smicha long enough to build schools long enough to build a community within a community that while pretending to be jewish they're 100 percent not jewish christian missionaries the world is completely oblivious of the danger that is among us. Someone I recently met, bright woman named uh, Shannon Nuzen, anti-missionary, has a organization called uh, Benenu, who exposed the uh, wicked idol worshiper Michael Elk, who pretended to be a Jewish Kohen and a Mekubal of the descendants of the uh, Ben Ishchai. The guy is not even Jewish, but he fooled an entire community that he's a Kohen, that he is a Jew, that he is of the descendants of the Ben Ishchai and, the, uh, uh, <laughs> and some of the greatest Mekubalim in the world. And this person, only by the mercy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, only by the mercy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu was exposed. And she wrote an article, published uh, today, I saw it, that these types of missionaries are literally a standard, a standard now in Jewish communities. You have these moles, all over Israel, needless to say, all over America, all over the UK, all over Australia, these non-Jewish Christian missionaries pretending to be Jews are everywhere. Now, when your knowledge is your number one weapon, you would hope that people would want to gain knowledge. And needless to say, people would use it but when you bring people this information instead of them saying okay so we have knowledge let's teach first and foremost the community how to deal with these wicked people if they ever come to you and they haven't been exposed yet how to deal with missionaries how to fend off some of these uh nonsensical uh heretical statements that they make that get people confused whether it's distortion of verses from Isaiah 53 or Daniel 9 or other places in the book of Genesis that they like to distort the, uh, the, uh, the sages. They like to mock the sages. They hate Rabbi Akiva. And if they were uh, uh, in their private meetings, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a statue of Rabbi Akiva where they throw darts at it and shoot it with a shotgun. Really, they hate Rabbi Akiva because he's in essence the, uh, the father of the oral Torah. With Rachel, his, uh, his wife, being the mother of the Oral Torah. So the Christians hate the Oral Torah. They hate the Gemara, also known as the Talmud. But yet, they go into Jewish communities, religious Jewish communities, secular Jewish communities, pretending to be Jews, pretending to be religious Jews, pretending to be 
any type of Jew that's going to get them close to people, friendly with people. And when you tell the religious Jews in your community that you have a mole in your community, you have people that are teaching the New Testament idolatry. And they ask you, how do you know? Well, there's a reason why the New Testament was translated to Yiddish. Last I checked, the people from Texas, Utah, or, or, or Tennessee, I don't think they, uh, they uh, learn Yiddish in high school. I don't think they learn Yiddish in their, uh, in their uh, Christian schools. That Yiddish is for you in Muncie. That Yiddish is for you in Lakewood. That Yiddish is for you in Bnei Brak, Hashem Yishmer V'yatzin. They have somebody within the community help them destroy the community. If that's not bad enough, they have all types of other things. They have these different people walking. They have places. You tell this to the Jewish people. What do they do? Nine out of ten times, if not even more, absolutely nothing. Why? They don't think there's anything that's going to affect their community because their community has Jewish education. They figure, oh, since we, our kids go to yeshiva, since I went to yeshiva, and my father's a rabbi, and my cousin is a rabbi, and this one and that one, we don't have to worry about it. This is probably more of a concern in secular neighborhoods where people don't know anything. There's nothing further from the truth. Why? Shows. Shows that you look at the statistics, you look at the results, you look at society. I deal with thousands and thousands of people every single day. And many of them are religious Jews. And sometimes those religious Jews start asking me Christian questions. Why are you asking Christian questions if you've been going to yeshiva your whole life? Why are you asking me Christian questions if your whole life you've only been learning Torah? Why are you asking? Because somebody got to them one way or another, whether it was on YouTube or it was uh, some friend or some neighbor or some rabbi that's not really a rabbi, but rather a Christian missionary. Now, Rabbi Karim comes the kicker. How do you deal with this problem? Now, of course, education. But what if you have the education? What do you do then? Comes the Torah and says, Pen yish, pen yesh bachem ish o isha, o mishpacha, o shevet, asher levavo pone ayom eim Adonai Eloheinu, lalechet lavod et Elohe agoim ahem, פן יש בכם שורש פורי ראש ולענה. והיה בשם אוי דברה אלה הזאת, והתברך בלבבו לאמור, שלום יהיה לי, כי בשרירות ליבי אלך למען שפות ערבה אז את עצמה. לא יאווה אדוני שלוח לו, כי אז יעשן אף אדוני בקנאתו באיש ההוא. ורבצה בו כל העלה הכתובה בספר הזה. Comes the Kadosh Baruch Hu and tells us, I just mentioned the idolatry of wood, I just mentioned the idolatry of stone, I just mentioned the idolatry of money, I mentioned the idolatry of honor and everything else. These are idolatries you're going to have to deal with until Mashiach comes. And if you don't know how to deal with them, you are already losing the battle. In fact, the only way to deal with them is to be willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of fighting for the truth. Okay, so fight for the truth, make lectures to a bunch of strangers. That makes you good, right? But how many of you are doing it? That's not what Akadosh Baruch is talking. That's not what HaKadosh Baruch is talking about. What is HaKadosh Baruch Hu talking about? He says, perhaps there is among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away today from being with Hashem, our God, to go and serve the gods of those nations. Perhaps there is among you a root Flourishing uh, Michael L. Cohen Machshim of What? This is my edition. What if somebody like that is there? What if Eitan and Moti are in your community? Machshim of 
What if a Misa? What if a, a, a Imanis? What if a Mirvis is in your community flourishing? What if he's there? Let's see what Kadosh Baruch says. Perhaps there is among you a root flourishing with gall and wormwood, and it will be that when he hears the words of this imprecation, he will bless himself in his heart, saying, Peace will be with me, though I walk as my heart sees fit, thereby adding the water to pond the thirsty. There is no reward and punishment in his mind. He's completely deluded. He's serving a man as if it's God. He's simply insane. But yet he gets you to say nothing because you're politically correct and you feel bad and he's old and he looks religious and he's your father and he's your cousin and maybe even your son what do you do with such a person well i tried talking to him rabbi and he just wasn't listening well like a those who says if you don't make the sacrifice then i will what does that mean Hashem will not be willing to forgive him if you leave him a Christian missionary, if you leave him a Mechalel Shabbat, if you leave him an idolater, and you don't really sacrifice everything to get him to do tshuva, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu will sacrifice him. Why? Because that's the way it works when you mess with the king. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I will Hashem. Will not be willing to forgive him, for then Hashem's anger and jealousy will smoke against that man, and the entire imprecation written in his book will come down upon him, and Hashem will erase his name from under the heavens. In fact, Hashem will set him aside for evil from among all the tribes of Israel. Like all the imprecations of the covenant that is written in his book of the Torah. You can see this yourself in the Chumash. You see, Rabbi Karim, if people in our community do not wake up, then they're forcing a Kadosh Baruch Hu's hand to wake up the community. And that wake up call, Rabbi Karim, is not an alarm clock. It's painful. So now what are you going to do when your father and your mother tell you to go against the Torah? Continue stealing from the Goim. What if you do, if your parents tell you, no, I don't want you to go to this Shiul Torah. I want you to continue watching Netflix with me. What do you do when your friends tell you, let's go to a nightclub or a movie or some other form of mental torture. Let's go somewhere like that instead of Go to Bet Knesset, go to Kolel, go learn Torah. What do you do? You have to start telling them no. And stop thinking, yeah, but they're going to argue with me. Good! Let them argue. And you argue back. Remind them that their life is completely purposeless. Remind them that their life is simply idolatrous. Don't worry, you don't have to become the best speaker on planet Earth. In one second, all you need to do is the following. I don't want to go, or I don't want to eat this, or I don't want to violate Shabbat. But in case you're wondering why, here, watch this lecture. Finished. Finished. You say, what lecture? Oh, pick whichever one you want. Hashem took back his millions, Tikkun Abrit, Chibuta Kevel. Ah, we got some new tools for you. Shabbat, the Eternal Covenant, all types of wonderful lectures. Soon, there's going to be some other ones too, I promise, Bezlat Hashem. But you give them one of those tools, you don't have to battle it, but you tell them, listen, you want to violate Shabbat, you want to go pray to a man, you want to go desecrate Hashem's name, you want to go to nightclubs, that's your life, but I'm not doing it. And in fact, I'm going to defend my position by trying to help you. How? Reminding you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Here, watch this lecture. 
Here, go to this rabbi in a YouTube channel. Go to his app. Go see this. Go see that. Don't just say, listen, I took care of myself and therefore I'm fine. No, Habibi. You have to say something, even if he's a family member, even if he's close, even if he's superior. You have to say something. Why? Akadosh Baruch Hu brought this to your house for a reason. He brought this to our communities for a reason. And if we continue turning a blind eye to our brothers in different communities, if we continue turning our back, to our Am Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, You religious people are saying, Shalom Yeli. You figured that. Why? Because you sent your kids to Yeshiva. Everything is going to be good. While your secular brothers, while your heretical brothers, while your, uh, your spiritually sleeping brothers are completely losing their Allah by, and you think you're okay in your communities. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Absolutely not. I'm sending them to your communities. I'm sending them to your communities, forcing you, forcing you to deal with it and by default helping your secular brother that has fallen for their trap years ago. If we as a people do not wake up, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is simply going to literally uncover the web, the web of idolatry and the web of sin, the web of destruction. That's already in there, but we haven't been aware of it yet. We haven't been noticing it yet to a large extent. They're there. The Michael Elks of the world are there. They're everywhere. But their impact is relatively minimal. It's only starting to really create bigger damage in the yeshivot, in the kolel, in the Jewish community. It's only starting now. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu has had it with us. He says, it's because of you religious people that I destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, not because of the secular people. The secular people, obviously they deserve the punishment, but I didn't destroy the Bet HaMikdash because of them. I destroyed it because the religious people didn't care about the secular people. In fact, they thought that as long as they're religious, everything's okay. Look at the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat. There's three dapim about this specific issue. 54, 55, 56 in Masechet Shabbat, Talmud Bavli. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, someone that does not rebuke, the entire sin goes on him. And when a Kadosh Baruch Hu saw that there's no religious people rebuking, there's no rabbis rebuking, he ended up punishing the religious community first. This is what's happening today. You see, practically every house has somebody fall off the derech. As the Torah says, en bay chen bomet. There's no house, there's no spiritually dead person. Every household has somebody that's spiritually dead, leaving for idolatry, leaving for heresy, heresy, leaving for all types of filthy desires. He was a rabbi for 10 years, suddenly became a woman. How could such a thing be? Because no one cared enough to remove the idolatry from within the community. No one cared enough to help this person remove their heretical thoughts. Why? Because they figured if I'm okay, my kids are okay, everything is okay. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, saying Shalom Yeli, whether you are the sinner or you're watching the sinner, either way I won't forgive you. Why I won't forgive you? Kol Yisrael, Aravim All of Israel are responsible for each other. We are the spiritual nervous system of the world. And if we don't start worrying about each other, helping each other, we're all going to lose. Hashem Ishmael. We're all going to lose, Rabotai Karim. I don't think that this is just something that is, maybe, maybe it has to do with a different generation. After all of this horrific threats, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, HaKtuba Basefer HaTorah Azot Ve'amar HaDor HaAcharon Benechem Actually, it starts. Says the last generation, the Dor Acharon, the Dor Acharon, the last generation, will say, Your children who will arise after you, and the foreigners who will come from a distant land. When they will see the plagues of the land and the illnesses, 
with which Hashem has afflicted it, sulfur and, and salt and conflagration and destruction in, in, in the world. Last generation to see destruction. Not just physical destruction all the time. Destruction like having someone that calls themselves religious as the prime minister in Eretz Yisrael becoming partners with the anti-Torah world. Having a prime minister of Eretz Yisrael give $53 billion to a group of terrorists that their number one task is kill Jews. Yet it's being funded by so-called religious Jew. People are going to ask, how could this be? How did this happen? How did this happen? How did the land turn upside down? Land turned upside down, Abutai, because people were not willing to sacrifice. People were not willing to sacrifice. He figured that if he leaves the money in his stock account, and if he leaves the money in his Bitcoin and if he leaves the money in his uh, bank account, then it's safer there. What about giving that money to build more Torah, to defend Am Yisrael against all of the idolatry that's infiltrated every community? What about using that money to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name by helping Avrichim learn more and more Torah and create more Kedusha in the world? What about using that money to build yeshivot that teach the emet and pay high salaries to the rabbis that teach the truths, the, the rabbinit that teach the truth without thinking twice, high salaries to such people, reward them for teaching the truth. What about using that money for that? No, I like my Bitcoin account. I like my stock account. I like having a portfolio of properties. Okay, Habibi. You keep your portfolio properties, you keep your stock account and your Bitcoin account, and the Torah world will survive with or without you. But just so you know, for every single dollar that you do not invest in the Torah world and you leave in this world, not only will you regret it, but very likely you'll be punished for it. For every single penny that you could have invested in the Torah to save Am Yisrael from the abomination surrounding it, for every single dollar that you could have and should have invested in Torah and you don't, you will get punished for it. Hence the reason why the Chafetz Chaim says rich people are poor people. Why are they poor people? They'll get punished for all the money that they didn't donate for the Torah. Shem people don't understand. We're not saying that a person should take every single penny that they have accumulated over many years and become homeless tomorrow and, by, and build the yeshiva tomorrow. But who needs all this? Who needs 50 properties, 10 properties, 20 properties? Who needs a portfolio with millions and millions of dollars? Now, if you don't have any opportunities to build holiness in the world and simply everybody else has already done it before you, okay, fine, but who, who, who are you kidding? There are endless amount of opportunities to feed people, to help people, to build yeshivot, to build kolos, to build kedusha, to pay the rabbis big money so they can tell the truth and not be afraid to get fired. Pay people to tell the truth. Rabbi, listen, I know in your last community, they fired you because you told the truth. In our community, we double your salary because you told the truth. The more truth you tell us, the more people are going to do tshuva. The more people do tshuva, the better you'll do. The better you'll do personally. The more we'll help you, Rabbi. Do that with that money. Instead of building another house, another property, another factory, another shtuyot. Rabotai Yekarim, if you're not willing to sacrifice, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're not in a good position, but this is not something I can teach you. Why well, can't teach you? Either you get the point or you don't. Either you get the point that you have to make sacrifices, which means by default, sacrifice hurts. Sacrifice hurts. Ending a relationship hurts. Getting rid of something you like hurts. Not doing something you enjoy hurts. Telling people the truth hurts. 
but you know that it's all for the best and therefore you do it. You know that this is the cure and therefore you do it. You can't teach this. You can't teach this. Why? You either have it or you don't. But this week's Parashat Nitzavim tells us one way or the other you will realize that sacrifice is the way to go. Either you'll realize it because you didn't do it and therefore you saw your own community, household, family member, friend, somebody you know get destroyed by the abominations of the world because there wasn't enough sacrifice for the sake of Hashem and His Torah. Or you'll know because you did it and it worked out. And not only did it work out, you saw people come back to life from spiritual death because of it. But you can't teach sacrifice. Either you have it or you don't. People always ask me, Rabbi, listen, I have this brother, cousin, son, brother, this, that, somebody that I know important to me. And I really want them to do tshuva. And I told them about Hashem, and I told them about tshuva, but they don't want to listen. I said, well, stop telling them. Oh, so I'm okay? No, no, you're not okay, but stop telling them. Let me tell him. Send him one of my films. Send him one of my lectures. Maybe you're not the vessel. Maybe I am, especially since this is what I do all day and all night. Send them. Sometimes somebody will tell me, listen, you know, this guy, he knows the truth. He knows the truth, but uh, what can I tell you, Rabbi? He knows the truth. He knows he's not supposed to be with that girl. She knows she's not supposed to be with that guy. They know they're not supposed to be working in that profession. They know, but they just can't get over the Yetzirah. You know, he's addicted to her. She's addicted to him. They're addicted to them, addicted to money. They're addicted to this. So what do you do, Rabbi? What do you do? Nothing. If they are not willing to sacrifice a little bit of pleasure that they get, to fix their situation, no one can help them. You have to be willing to help yourself in order for the help from the outside to work. If somebody's throwing you a ladder, if somebody's throwing you a life vest and you don't want to grab it, it doesn't matter how good of a quality the life vest is or the ladder is. If you don't want to grab it and you simply want to continue drowning, just because you want to show people that you could swim, no one can help you. If you want to listen to those two heretics or three heretics or four heretics that are telling you to go against the Torah because you figure it's all going to turn out okay anyway, no one can help you. No one can help you. You have to be willing to help yourself. If you're not willing to learn Torah each day for at least an hour or two, no one can help you. If you don't want to start putting on a kisui rosh because you're a married woman, if you don't want to start covering yourself because you have to be modest, no one can help you. Those diseases you have will not go away. Those blessings you get will not work. Why? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu gets the blessing from the tzaddik. He says, wow, this tzaddik just blessed this lady. Let's see. Why is he blessing this lady? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu for a second looks and then runs away. Why? Imadisti HaKadosh Baruch Hu said in last week's parasha makes me run away. I went to her because the Gemara in Masech Sukkah, page 14 says, when the tzaddik gives a blessing, when the tzaddik brings a blessing, HaKadosh Baruch Hu fulfills, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes the blessing of the tzaddik seriously. But the Torah also says that when a Kadosh Baruch Hu sees immodesty, he runs away. The Torah says, I don't want to see a thing of immodesty in you because I'm going to run away, turn my back to you. So yes, you got a blessing from a tzaddik or 10 tzaddikim or 20 tzaddikim. But if you're not modest, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Why? Because you're not modest. 
But Rabbi, I know I'm modest. But I, my blessing didn't work also. Maybe because you're Mechalel Shabbat, Habibi. Well, what's that have to do with it, Rabbi? If I drive on Shabbat and I work on Shabbat and I do everything on Shabbat, why, why isn't the blessing with Sadi going to work for me? Because you're an idolater. You're an idolater. Do you understand that? In the eyes of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, you're his son that's an idol worshiper. You're a son that's worship that says somebody else is your father. That's you want to you want him to bless you, to cure you. That that disease that he gave you, that sickness, that problem that he gave you is perhaps the only tool left for Hashem to use while keeping you alive to help you do chuba. So what do you want? You want him to give you a blessing to cure you? If he cures you, you'll never do chuba. You see, Habibi, if you're not willing to sacrifice for the sake of saving yourself, no one's going to be able to help you. And that's really the biggest secret of tshuva. The people that succeed in doing tshuva are people that are willing to take their own lives in their hands and make whatever sacrifices are possible to improve the situation. To listen to Hashem, to change their life, to change their thinking, to change their attitude. And they work on it day and night making sacrifices. And the people that become important in the world. That when the judgment day comes and HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, listen, this person's time has come. Why? When I created this person, I already decided he's going to live X amount of years. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, okay, well, Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to finalize, that's it, it's the end. But he sees, wait a minute. This guy, I only told him, I only said he's going to live X amount of years. But in the last year, in the last two years, in the last five years, in the last week, he's become a Mezakeh Rabim. She has become a Mezakeh Rabim. She's become an investor in Kiruv. She has taken Kiruv and getting my children to do tshuva. She's made her the number one priority in our life. I can't get rid of her. Comes the Malach and says, wait a minute, but Hashem, but you, but, 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 but you said that I'm allowed to kill her at 40 years old, at 50 years old. I said you can kill that person at 40, 50 years old. I didn't say you killed this person. This person is needed in the world. Anyone that wants to have a good judgment on Rosh Hashanah and be given a long life, Make sure that their number one investment is in helping Am Yisrael return to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? You become needed by people. Therefore, their merit, their merit counts for you also. And in essence, you could literally change something that was already written before you came to the world. But you think that's going to come cheap? You think that's going to come easy? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, Abutai. Sacrifice is the only way for a person to truly get to the highest levels in this world. And when a person is willing to sacrifice everything to change themselves and do tshuva, when a person is willing to sacrifice everything to make sure that their marriage is a happy marriage and not just one that is stable, when a person is willing to sacrifice everything that his kids get the best chinuch in the world and he makes sure that the rabbis and the rebbitsons that they have are literally the best and they feel the best and they are going to do their best because they're not missing anything. When a person is willing to sacrifice everything to make sure that his community has everything and anything possible that he could offer to make sure that they are protected from all evil, all abominations, all idolatry, all missionizing. When a person is doing their best, their very best, and willing to sacrifice everything to help a complete stranger just because he's your brother from a different mother but still the same nation. And you're willing to help him. And you're willing to help her. And you're willing to help them do tshuva. And you're willing to help them get closer to Hashem, directly or indirectly. And you're willing to help them have money for food for this holiday. And you're willing to help them dress their kids. You're willing to do it. And in fact, you're going to make a sacrifice to do it. When you've already gotten to that point where all day and all night you're sacrificing, then you get the point. Then you get the point. Then you're living a life that's worth living. Why? Because then you're fulfilling what the Torah actually said. 
ואהבת את השם אלוקיך בכל לבביך, בכל נפשך ובכל מאודיך. Love Hashem your God with all of your heart, with all of your life and all of your money. We see, Rabbi Karim, that having Hashem in our life is not enough. We have to give Him everything, all of our heart, all of our life, all of the sacrifices, the greatest sacrifices are reserved for Hashem. Now, some people say, okay, so I'm just willing to die for him. No, no, Habibi. He's talking about money. He's talking about time. He's talking about effort. He's talking about learning. He's talking about every resource that you have, not just end it with the one-time thing. When a person is willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of Hashem, he'll understand why to sacrifice everything for Hashem means to sacrifice everything for Hashem's children. And when you do that, you have the ultimate skula. To be a person that's going to be living a long and prosperous life and be judged favorably each and every Rosh Hashanah. Be'ezrat Hashem, each one of us will be judged favorably this Rosh Hashanah. Each one of us will do tshuva before Rosh Hashanah. And by the time Rosh Hashanah arrives in just a few days, we're already going to have the plans of how to make next year even better. הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אנחנו נכנסים בעזרת השם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. קהילה ספרדית גדולה.